Doves fly at the Fed as officials signal they are done raising rates, instead raising the number of rate cuts they see next year. Officials left the overnight rate unchanged at five and a quarter to five and a half percent, but they essentially confirmed that's it. The money quote from the statement gets a one word addition in determining the extent of any additional policy firming that may be appropriate to return inflation to 2%. The dot plot, meanwhile, sees 75 basis points of cuts next year, one more move than they saw in September. The dispersion is wide, however, with eight seeing fewer than those three cuts, five seeing more than three. In 2025, they see an additional four rate cuts, one down from September, and two more in 2026. The longer-run neutral rate remains at 2.5%. Their move comes as they significantly lower their median headline inflation forecast this year to 2.8%. As the statement notes, inflation has eased over the past year, but remains elevated. In the median forecast, it falls further in 2024 to 2.4%, 2.1% in 2025, and 2% finally in 2026. Core PCE inflation, 3.2% this year, down from September's forecast of 3.7%. It keeps falling, hitting 2% also in 2026. The statement says, quote, growth of economic activity has slowed from its strong pace in the third quarter, but they still revised their median forecast for GDP growth this year significantly to 2.6 percent from 2.1 percent in September. It falls to just 1.4 percent next year. Potential growth in the longer run is seen at 1.8 percent. No change in their unemployment forecast of 3.8% this year, which implies the jobless rate moves up in December because it's 3.7% right now. The next three years, the median unemployment rate will come in at 4.1%. The decision, guys, again, unanimous. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Let's make it very simple. The 2024 dot implying three cuts next year from this Federal Reserve. It doesn't meet the market, but it closes the gap and endorses the direction of travel over the last four to six weeks. In the bond market, this is what's falling right now. Yields and falling hard. We're down 19, call it 20 basis points lower at the front end of the curve on a two year, 4.53. On a 10 year, down 13 at 4.07%. Once you figure out where the bond market is, take a guess where the FX market is. The dollar looks a little something like this. Against the euro at the moment, weaker. The euro stronger, 108.45. And if you're looking at equities, we endorse a move higher, up by a half of 1% this morning on the S&P 500, up again this afternoon on the NASDAQ by four tenths of 1%. Lisa, the rally moves on. We could end up getting a sub 4% 10 year yield by the end of this trading session as the uh, as people parse through this. To me, the fact that this is unequivocally dovish, that they endorse the Fed's idea, that the market's idea of rate cuts and then some really speaks to a question of is there going to be cleanup act on, on aisle one or is this going to be Fed Chair Powell saying we're just responding to the data in front of us and it looks pretty good? Well, we talk about, Tom, the <clears throat> risk, the potential of being whipsawed by Chairman Powell at about 27 minutes time. The early take, and we'll see if it sticks, the early take is this. Ultimately, you're looking for three cuts next year. Our four or five cuts no longer sounds that ridiculous. Now you come closer and closer to where we were before. No hedging here. I was going back and forth with a professor at the University of Cambridge and two standard deviations down on 10-year yield. John, we almost came to it. We came very, very close at two at 4.08%, 4.07 at 4.6. We'll have to see what plays out with the press conference, but this is frankly more than we expected. We also expect wonderful conversation at this moment with Diane Swank. She's chief economist at KPMG. Diane, you know the interest uh, space is the litmus paper of our economic and our Fed system. Are we seeing a constructive reduction in yields or does this signal slower economic growth? Well, I think what we're seeing is that the bond market is leaning into the concept of the 
fact that inflation has plummeted so rapidly. I think this is a full inflation story. There's no question that the Fed is has showed its cards here. They're very excited about the fact that inflation has come down at its fastest pace outside of World War II, the Korean War, and the Volcker recessions. That is really stunning given we've not seen a major increase in unemployment with that, and they're feeling good about it. And I think you're going to see some of that euphoria from Chairman Powell as well. It's more than we expected. The, I, it is rem- important to remember that, remember, last time they had a rate hike po- before the end of the year. So just by removing one rate hike out of it, that puts one more cut into 2024 as well. And I think that sort of nuance is lost in translation. But it is part of the story as well, is they're not really backing off higher for a period of time. The next question is higher for how long? Some big moves. I think we might be close to higher for long enough. Some big moves in this bond market right now. We're down to 17 basis points on a front end on a two year at 456 on a 10 year down 11 to 4.09 percent alongside Dan Swan. Completes to say Greg Peters of PGM jumps in front of the camera. Greg, let's talk about it in about 24 minutes time. Chairman Powell has an opportunity to clarify some of this. Do you think he needs to? Well, well, I'm not sure there's much he can do at this point. I, I mean, the market just absolutely loved, loved this result. Uh, I thought the market was already leaning a little too much. Uh, evidently, that wasn't the case. We weren't leaning enough. So, uh, you know, doves fly and bulls run after this. And um, <laughs> I think it's really hard for uh, Powell to put that genie back in the bottle. Does that give you a sense, uh, doves flying and uh, bulls running, the idea of FOMO and just how much that's taken over the market after so many people missed out in 5% 10-year yields? I think that's just an artifact of the current market, right? I mean, the markets are much more volatile. Uh, they, they move much more powerfully. I think that's just the construct, right, with CTAs and algos and other sorts of things. And I think this is the world that we live in, honestly. So I don't think this is a unique feature anymore. I think this is quite commonplace. Uh, Diane Swank, I did the nominal GDP math here on the inflation guesstimate and the growth guesstimate. And boy, it sure looks to me like a 4% nominal GDP, even south of that modeled out over the next 24 months. How do our viewers and listeners react to that if our animal spirit post-pandemic diminishes down sub 4%? We know what's interesting about it is that also the part that we didn't talk about in the SEPs is that the Fed's long-term estimates of what the neutral rate on the Fed funds rate, if you look at their ranges, that has actually continued to move up. And so I think what you're seeing here is that an economy that the Fed expects to cool below potential, unemployment to come up a little bit, although we might not, I, the consumer has really taken everything. The Fed's tried to deal them and, you know, taken it with stride and kept on going. And I think that that may mean some upside risk to the economic growth side of this situation. But it's really interesting that the Fed's terminal rates now look like they're starting to move up even more than they were last time. And that seems to have gotten lost in translation. That's not what the market's focused on right now. But I think the Fed is looking at an economy that's more resilient and that will take off more rapidly as rates come down. Does that cohere with what you think, that basically we're talking about a higher new neutral rate as we uh, have no landing or a very, very soft one? Exactly. I think we are at a higher non-inflationary rate. And I think that's something you you see it just in the slowness with which the Fed puts out its cuts and not getting back. The the cent on rates is not as rapid as the ascent on rates and the need. You know, you see it in their long term forecast, even as all this good news has come in, it's come in and it's really shifted the, the narrative in terms of, you know, we're trying so hard to get up to an inflation target for so long. Long, the Fed does still believe that we're in a world, and it sort of was illustrated by the volatility in the bond market we were just talking about, that we're in a world that's more susceptible to external shocks than it once was. We've also gotten incredibly good news on oil prices coming down, helping to spill over into inflation. All of that's great. It doesn't mean that we're going into the world of subpar growth, of you know inability to get inflation up that we left in the 2010s. We have yield balance sheets, except for the federal government, 
quite significantly since then. And I think that's where the paradigm shift is. And Diane, let's go through the projections together. The median for 2024, GDP 1.4%, unemployment 4.1%, core PCE 2.4%, Fed funds 46 Diane, not so long ago, you and I used to talk about this being aspirational. How realistic is it now? It now seems entirely possible. And you know what? More things than, than I can list have surprised me about this economy. And this is not where we thought we'd be, but how glorious it is that we're here. It's not been easy. It's not as if interest rate sectors aren't feeling pain. They are. The housing market is still stuck in a mortgage winter, even though rates are coming down. This will help unlock some demand, but prices are still too high and the supply of homes is still too much in a shortage, especially in the single family home market. So we know there's still strains in this economy, but the good news is we didn't have to get here without the kind of pain that, you know, I think back on that speech, eight minutes, 34 seconds, August 2022, it was like a bucket of ice, you know, with their chairman, Chairman Powell really believed we would have to go through a recession in order to rid ourselves of this inflation. And that's just not been the case. Much more of it was supply chains un un uncurling and the problems that we had there, along with some time to let demand the production pick up with demand and i think that's important otherwise known as transitory just not called transitory greg can you buy into this uh this sense it was, that yes, we're transitory <laughs> greg, over a much longer period of time greg yes. peters can you weigh in a little bit on whether you think this is plausible or whether you would lean against this right now or whether you would actually even sell and wait for for a better buying moment i mean i do think the markets are really pushing uh, the limits here. Uh, there's so much good news being priced in, whether it's inflation, whether it's growth. You know, the yield curve is still inverted, right? And so, like, how do you reconcile the fact that uh, investors are feeling really good about the growth outlook, inflation's coming down and the curve's inverted? And um, so I think there's still some repricing ahead. I think there's still quite bumpy uh, elements uh, in the road ahead. Uh, and right. so, yeah, I'm 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 kind of thinking the market is really taking this to the brink here, and I'm and uh, I would be inclined to go the other way. Greg, I'm looking at money market funds five percent and all the other stuff we blather about each and every day, and I know we get convexity in the stock market. Do we get convexity in the bond market when I got a ten-year real yield pop into one point nine one? I got the ten-year yield on plus, uh, excuse me, minus two standard deviations, right down on four point oh six percent. Can there be such a thing as momentum in the bond market, price up, yield down? Yeah, I think you're saying it, Tom. I mean, if you look at the total return in the bond market over the past month or so, it's been, you know, quite astounding, right? You know, anywhere from five to, yes. you know, eight percent. That's real money, right? Uh, uh, and so you've seen it. And so there has been some, quote unquote, positive convexity just given the low level of prices, right? But but, uh, you know, the real question is not what happened, but where are we going? Um, and so, you know, once again, I worry about, uh, you know, the current market really squeezing a lot of the total return out of the market way too soon. Well, look at the move this afternoon. It's a monster move. We're down almost 20 basis points at the front end of the curve. Allow me to share a quote with you. It would be premature to conclude with confidence that we have achieved a sufficiently restrictive stance or to speculate on when policy might ease. Chairman Powell, not even two weeks ago, on December 1st, Diane Swung, in 15, 16, 17 minutes time when we hear from the chairman again, why would the message be any different? Well, I think he's still going to be cautious in his messaging. But, you know, you saw a little bit of the lightness in his step and we saw the bond market rally November 1st, even though we had what was a hawkish set of, um, uh, you know, in September, a hawkish outlook. By November 1st, you saw the market unwind significantly since then because of how euphoric and a little bit um, excited that Chair Powell was in that press conference. And so I think it's going to be hard for him to walk back a lot at this point in time. I think it would do him good to be cautious and to be a little bit, you know, contingent on, you know, we're, we're excited, but here's the risks. But I think it's going to be hard given they signed off on this statement and they signed off on this forecast. And this is 
a dovish is about as dovish as we could have expected. I this is more than I expected in terms of dovishness, and I think it's hard for him to walk it back. And I don't think he would be walking it back all that much, given the fact that they all signed off on it. Which is the reason why you're seeing he's an not going to add to it. Yeah. But he's not going to push back too much. Which is the reason why, and it's a good point, that you're seeing an 18 basis point drop in the two-year yield as time goes on, 5.5, 4 4.54%. Greg, you said you'd push back against this. The market's really taking this to the brink. What makes you feel that way? And what could you hear from Chair Powell that could change your mind? Well, so I'm not sure I'm going to hear much from Chair Powell. You know, as I mentioned, I think uh, uh, the genie's out of the bottle. Uh, I think it's hard to walk this back. I think at some level uh, uh, he is quite pleased, and rightfully so, right? They've seen uh, a tremendous amount of disinflation come through uh, during the course of this year, and that's something to be proud of. But I guess just from a market pricing fixed income perspective, you know, do we really want to be in an environment where we're, we're taking down yields so aggressively, where we're basically have to see uh, these rate cuts come through uh, and then some in order to achieve total return? So, you know, to me, it's just a balance about risk reward and what's embedded in the price. And I think, quite frankly, there's a lot of good news uh, embedded in the price. And that's always uh, something that you should, uh, you know, take a step back. A ton of good news priced in over the last month. Greg Peters, Diane Swank, two of the very best going into this Federal Reserve news conference with Chairman Powell in about 14 minutes time. Thanks to both of you. Let's talk about these moves. No big changes to that statement. No change in the decision, but some monster changes to the projections. Take 2024, for instance. Fed funds, median dot, now 4.6%. Back in September, that was 5.1. This is a Fed, it's a median dot, implying that maybe three cuts are in our future from this Federal Reserve. The market may be 50 basis points lower than that. But ultimately, Lisa, we've closed the gap and we've endorsed the direction of travel over the last six weeks, which is why you've got this monster move again on a two-year by 19 basis points of 4.53. So if you don't stop the direction, if you don't stop the momentum, what happens? You do more of the same, don't you, Lisa? Isn't that what's happening? Which is what Priya Misra said, that this was the asymmetry. And this is what Greg Peters, uh, as well as Diane Swank, both said, which is it was more than they expected and certainly more than the market expected. And the market is cheering. Basically, this message is that Chair Powell cannot walk this back. The rest of the Fed members put this in. So he either leans in, he either gives an explanation of weakening in the economy that isn't seen in the, in the projections, or he kind of equivocates and, and basically is, you know, circling around with his tail. And Neil Dutta, Renaissance Macro, super modest. Do you want the quote? Complete vindication of a March cut. <laughs> 95 is a good analog. Surgical cuts are coming. Buckle up. Risk appetite has room to run. Well, did he nail it? He nailed it for sure. Check out the scores going into the news conference on the S&P 500, fourth day of gains on the cards. Unless Chairman Powell messes that up for you. On the S&P 500, up by 0.6% on the S&P into the bond market. I know we've seen some big moves in fixed income, but these are big moves again. We're down 20 basis points on a two-year. 453.53. We'd seen big moves coming into today's decision. We're down large again. We're down 12 on a 10-year at 4.08%. Let's continue the conversation with Bank of America's Michael Gapen, Sabatra Japa of SocGen. Sabatra, first to you. You've had some time to chew over this one. What's your take on it? Yeah, definitely the, the, the dovishness in the dots caught me by surprise. Um, but I think it seems like they're looking at inflation starting to come down. Maybe they're looking at three-month and six-month moving averages and doing exactly what they did uh, a couple of years back when uh, you know they were looking at three-month and six-month moving averages, which were running a lot harder than the market. And, uh, and so they had to come in and start hiking. So I think you're, you're looking at a very similar scenario here where uh, they're willing, it seems, to adjust policy um, given the data that we have right now on inflation. Michael Gapin, thrilled to have you with us, particularly with the reach of the Bank of America across all of America, the consumer, the pulse of our 70% consumption. Do you buy this idea of the massive potential GDP slowdown of the next two years, sub 2% real GDP, inflation that's quiescent, nominal GDP that's 4% if we're lucky? Is that the evidence that the Bank of America sees? On balance, yes. Um, so the, our B of A uh, card data has been showing resiliency in consumer spending and pretty good holiday spend 
So our view is the slowdown, if we get one, is going to come in your non-consumer related components, business spending, the, the fiscal drag and so forth. Uh, so it, we think it's possible. We think the narrative around the idea that you don't need as much labor market pain to bring inflation down, the, the data is kind of confirming that. And it, it's, it matches with what we're seeing from, from our card data and, and, and around the health of the consumer. So yes, the economic activity should moderate, even personal consumption spending should slow. But we've gotten a lot of evidence here now over the past few months that maybe we don't need to crimp demand as much to return inflation to 2% and we can allow some of these supply side factors, whether it's supply chain or the rebound in the labor force, to, to help us out. Michael, could this rip roaring rally go against that? Could it make it more difficult to achieve the actual end of the soft landing by rejuvenating certain demand and rejuvenating animal spirits? I mean, possibly, but I, I think, you know, from a, the Fed kind of modulates demand, right? That they don't really control the supply side as much. And so I think what the, the balance here is to say, okay, maybe, maybe demand picks up a little bit, but that's probably more about the timing of the cuts and the pace of the cuts and that end terminal rate rather than the direction of travel. So yes, there's a risk that things would ease too quickly. The Fed prejudges this and they have to come back later and backtrack. That's going to be around the, the wait and see and how much confidence that, that they have in order to start a cutting cycle. But I think that's more about the timing and the pace of cuts than it is about having to backtrack. Subhadra, you and many other people were expecting hawkish pushback. That was actually the consensus belief coming into this meeting. Uh, does anything about this statement make you rethink how you would respond to this, that basically load the boat, FOMO is on, let's go? Yeah, I know, definitely. I mean, I think the FOMO trades already happened, right? We've had 10 yields uh, decline from 5% all the way down to now close to 4% in a very short amount of time. Um, so, you know, I think I would have to agree with uh, the this, this statement you read from Neil Dada earlier, which is maybe the market is looking towards a, a much more of a an adjustment in policy as we go along, uh, modus operandi, uh, from uh, the Fed. I mean, that's not our view. We still think that the Fed is going to keep policy on hold, at least till, uh, till May, till they see a very clear signal mm -hmm. that inflation is trending towards their 2% target. And we think that the economy, broadly speaking, should hold up, up, up until that point. Because it's, I mean, once we get to that point, I think the Fed can very quickly cut rates in a very short amount of time if there is a meaningful slowdown. The risk is that if they deliver these cuts too soon, then you could see perhaps a, a resurgence of this sort of services side inflation right. that we've been experiencing over the last couple of years. John, I'm going to predict that everybody's going to go in and they're going to blow up their call. They're going to blow up their year-end <laughs> outlook. I hear all this good talk. I think Michael Gapin is absolutely dead you on. You think it gets more bullish than it already is? It's not that it's bullish. This is, this is really, really important. This goes back to Diane Swank, Gina Martin Adams, and others. This, to me, is far more a real economy analysis redounding back to these dynamics. In the last two minutes, John, I got a 407 retest of the 10-year yield down 13 beefs. If that puppy breaks through 4.06, that is a massive signal that everybody has to rip up the script this afternoon. We joked earlier this morning that if the party started at the end of October, Governor Waller bought the tequila in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. It's not him I don't think we need to talk about. I think we need to be talking about New York Fed President John Williams. Mike, I remember when President Williams, a number of months ago, engaged a conversation about reducing interest rates as inflation continued to fall, just to keep real rates stable and to ensure that things didn't become tighter over time. Is it too early, too premature for Chairman Powell to engage in that type of conversation in this news conference? I don't. I mean, so maybe I'm a bit of a contrarian here because we, you know, we thought the median dot would come in at four six. We expected a shift in communication. So what I'm hearing today so far is in line with what I thought. So I do think it would be a proper first step to get out of a, a hawkish bias and a hiking bias and then start getting into a world of, you know, talking at least about a more balanced reaction function, not ruling out hikes, but also talking about conditions under under which you might ease, you have to start moving in that direction. Inflation, at least at the moment, is decelerating fast enough where it's not crazy to think you could cut in March if you're a committee member based on inflation alone. So there's not a lot of time to prepare between now and then. So it's something I think you do need to entertain. 
Subhadra, I'm curious your view on something we were hearing from Diane Swank, that this sort of soft landing implies actually a higher long-term neutral rate, that essentially there is more strength in this economy that can handle rates at a higher level. Are you seeing that within some of these projections and kind of adjusting your expectation just for that base of where the Fed's going to ultimately cut to? Yeah, that's uh, and an, uh, an, we. I completely agree with that. I mean, our view is that the Fed will cut rates by 150 basis points next year, and there will be more cuts in 2025, uh, with the uh, Fed funds rate getting a little bit north of three percent. So that's you know pretty much getting down to where they have their long run neutral rate of two and a half percent. So that sort of trajectory makes sense. The question really is, what does the curve do? under the circumstances. Right. And that's really where I feel like there's the story of the rebuild and term premium is still very much in, in play because the demand dynamics are still very skewed. We still have a decent right. amount of supply. And I think that that could lead to a meaningful steepening of the curve uh, while, that, while the cutting happens. Sabrata, to the heritage of derivatives at Sakjen, where, I have no idea where this happens, but if we have a, what is it, Lisa, the money market fund now, five point what? Well, 5.3, 5.5, right? At what point, Sabrat, Sabrat, if we bring the money market fund down, does a wall of money try to find a new warm place? Yeah, that's that's the risk, right? We have almost six trillion in money market funds. That money, if the returns are not attractive, are going to try to migrate towards other parts of the, of the yield curve. Or oh, give me a level. I mean, is it, but Sabrata, that. this is so important. Is this going to happen at 4.8%? Do we got to wait, wait, wait for 3.8%? When is the money market game over? Well, when the curve disinverts, perhaps. Um, mm -hmm. At the current time, two-year yields are still higher than, than where 10-year yields are. And so you're going to see money continue to flow into, into the very front end of the <clears> yield curve. At some point, I think, it, I think that... Uh, when the market, when, the, when cuts have been, uh, sufficient cuts have been delivered and it's been stimulative, I think that the, the, you're going to see that money migrate towards uh, risky assets or other higher yielding assets. Uh, but at, at the current time, you know, with the curve inverted, I think that the front end still looks quite attractive to us on a duration adjusted basis. Let's play questions for Chairman Powell. The news conference about three minutes away. Michael Gapen, what would you ask today? Uh, I mean, I would ask kind of what you... One question would be what you're referencing, essentially, what is what's the purpose of the cutting cycle to get policy easy to, to track a, 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 a real rate of interest that you think is appropriate? If so, what's what's that rate? The second I would ask him, is policy really restrictive? What what evidence outside of housing do you have to suggest that that policy is currently restrictive? So that'd be a bit of a counterfactual to to his view. And, and otherwise, the third question I'd ask is, you know, is it is it feasible just to make it clear? Is it feasible to cut on the inflation data alone or do you need to see weakness and activity in the labor market? Those are three I would probe. You don't get three, Mike. You're lucky if you get two. If you might, McKee, you're lucky if you get one. Sabatra, <laughs> give us the final word. What would you ask today? I'd be curious to see if the Fed would be inclined to deliver sort of, uh, you know, adjustments in policy like they did back in the 90s, because that's a, something that the market is looking towards is perhaps they they adjust, they stay on hold, and then they cut some more if needed. Uh, so it's not sort of your conventional cycle. I think to me, that's a very underpriced risk in the market is a 90s style rate cut cycle. Sabadra Japa, Michael Gapen, to the two of you, thank you. Just brilliant as always. Michael Gapen over at Bank of America, back in the seat and good to see. Absolutely nailed it. Looking for three cuts to go into that median dot in 2024. And Lisa, I think he's right to talk about not just dates, but thresholds. What is the bar? Where is the bar for when you start to deliver those cuts? What are you looking for? And now you've priced that, implied that in your projections. Haven't they got to engage in that conversation over the next hour? Yeah, is lower inflation enough, right? It just by de facto, or do they have to see some other uh, sort of weakness? And what are the parameters? What are the levels? These are important questions. I also just think that right now, What's he going to say other than just read it? And we've got some sort of uh, right. you know new sense that we are disinflating, and it's a positive thing, and we'll be vigilant and watch it, and uh, go with where we think it's appropriate. As I heard from our guests, they did not expect this. I did not expect this. This is a sea change shift back to the regime pre-pandemic. And John, you nailed it. 
bringing up John Williams and the idea months ago of a shocking reset to the R star before the pandemic. And today is a massive shift, a sea change moment in terms of getting beyond the pandemic. I went over this quote a little bit earlier this morning of Chairman Powell's, not even two weeks ago. It would be premature to conclude with confidence that we have achieved a sufficiently restrictive stance or to speculate on when policy might ease. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. Thanks for listening. Join us live weekdays from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Radio and on Bloomberg Television each day from 6 to 9 a.m. for insight from the best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. And subscribe to the Surveillance Podcast on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Bloomberg.com, and of course, on the Terminal. I'm Tom Keen, and this is Bloomberg.